want to do another one this fall. But everybody was impacted, and a myriad of stories came out from that time. But how many know that the Holy Spirit, the person of God, is at work today? It's not just a mythical power or a force. It's He is God. And He was working in this place and doing wonderful things. And, and God moved on Paul in a powerful way. I just want him to share kind of what happened uh, throughout the week. We ended with a, we had a worship band here on Thursday night. It was awesome. We could have stayed all night, I think. But uh, every night we could have stayed all night. It felt like, but uh, just kind of share what, what happened and throughout the week and what God did. So Monday night was just really great. The speaker was awesome. And, uh, you know, he had the altar call and I felt led to come up here, but I had to play piano for the worship team and my wife was telling me, oh, just don't go up on the stage, you know, just go meet with God. So I, I was like, no, nah, I got to play. I come up here and try to play. Well, pastor had his capo. He forgot his capo or something for those of you who don't forgot know music. <laughs> so it wasn't matching the chord. I couldn't find the key. I didn't know what was going on. So I'm like, okay, Lord, this is a sign. I'm down to the altar seeking you and stuff. I'm supposed to be there, right? So we're just all crying out to God, standing there, and uh, a woman behind me uh, just starts speaking loudly in tongues. And you know that's when God is speaking to the church, so the music settles down. And she finishes, and it's quiet. Well, you know, we're wait waiting for the interpretation, because that's biblical. We're supposed to do that. Well, it's, it's a little bit longer, and so then I, I start praying for the interpretation, you know, kind of half-heartedly because I'm not one to speak out and I'm just I've never done that before so I'm kind of like timid about it so I'm kind of like oh Lord you know if this is what you have for me but not really I'm good if you want to give it to somebody else <laughs> all of a sudden my heart starts pounding you know you recognize God when you, for me it's when my heart starts pounding for no reason my hands are raised and all of a sudden I'm seeing the vision of the words that God wants the church to know I'm like trying to hold it back, and my heart is just pounding. I, I swear I could see it out of my chest, and I'm like, okay, God, here it goes. And, and once I just took that step of faith and spoke those few words, God just really let loose and uh, spoke through me, just powerful, just where just, just amazing presence of God fell over me. And, and uh, you know, the rest of the altar time was just awesome. I went home. You know, I'm still can't get enough of God once you, you stepped into that, you know. And so I'm putting the kids to bed, opening the word, and I'm starting to have doubt. Like, oh, God, were those my own words? I, oh, I hope I didn't get this messed up. Well, then God shows me this vision of John 10.10. 10. I didn't know what it said. I didn't have it memorized. And so I figured, well, I'll open it up to John 10.10. 10. And basically, it just reiterated almost the first part of that interpretation of what the Lord said. I'm like, well, okay, Lord, I will not doubt you. This is, this is what you, who you are. So Tuesday was awesome. I was touched by God. Wednesday comes along. Again, you know, the, the worship was great. The speaking was just powerful. Um, and the altar time, well, you know, I want to come up to the altar again, you know, because I just want to be closer and just more in love with God, just be in his presence. So I'm standing there, you know, just worshiping God, just praying, you know, just lifting my hands and uh, just praying there. And uh, my heart starts beating again. I'm like, oh, God, no, not again. You know, I did the one, one day a week thing, you know, <laughs> that once in a lifetime I, I stepped out in faith. You know, I don't want to look like this super spiritual guy I, who's always got a word from God <laughs> and this and that. And I didn't want to. I was just worried about what man thought, you know, and I felt God like saying, no, you know my voice now. You know who I am. And again, God showed me his visions of some words that he wanted me to say. And this hand was extended and I was trying to ignore, it. you know, you're trying to talk yourself out. Lord, no, that's not you. That's me. All of a sudden, my right hand like this from the tips of my fingers to halfway down my arm were electrified like I've never had experience in my life. It's almost grabbing hold of a, just an electric fence, but it wasn't painful. It's was just shooting down my arm, and God's like, step out. And so I did, and God had another word for the church. I stepped out, and just a peace fell over me after that. And uh, just the presence of God filled this place. 
Yep. And I've never been touched like that before. So I went home again, you know, I'm opening the word on my own private time, put the kids, kids to bed, and now I'm excited to dive in. And I kind of was, you know, looking at the Bible and thinking, God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you choosing me specifically? What, what purpose is this? And basically he gave me the word um, Ephes- Ephesians 3.16, and he wanted me to turn to that. And in that, basically it says, I'm going to summarize it, it says I'm doing this out of, power and of love how deep how wide how long is the love of god and it's beyond your knowledge and that you would experience the fullness of god basically is what that says and i just began to weep because that is how much god loves for for us that is how much he wants us to just step out you know just empty it all out for him and just come to him with that brokenness that em- empty spirit and just say here we are and be ready to answer the call. And that's what I got out. And so during that time, God reiterated uh, during spiritual emphasis week, emphasis week that he wants me to be a preacher. And uh, he's been really <laughs> speaking loud to me the last couple of years. So personally, Praise it was a powerful me. time. And I don't want to lose that fire now that yeah. I have. You know that sometimes when you go off to Bible camp, you have that. Or when you become first saved. And I'm just like ready. I'm like, God, I'm ready. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, thanks, Paul. I, you know, so many uh, uh, amazing things happened during that week, and we're still kind of reveling, you know, a couple weeks after all, all that God has done, and, and just grateful for that. And, and, you know, we need the work of the Holy Spirit in God's church. We shouldn't be afraid of it. I know for, you know, some years, maybe ministries, and I myself as a leader, as a pastor, there's there's been people who have tried to abuse uh spiritual gifts as you will you know in the church and and take advantage of a, of a maybe lifting themselves up but you know i think that we need to be aware and sensitive to the fact that god does want to speak to his people he wants to heal he wants to give words of knowledge he wants to to give words of wisdom and all kinds of gifts that he has for his church so amen praise god god has good things well let's get started here today I've, if you have your Bibles and want to turn to Second Chronicles, we'll begin there in chapter 31. But when you think of great leaders, today I want to talk to, of course, men. We're talking about today is Father's Day, so we'll focus on men. I think would be important, and obviously uh, we're, we've broken from our series in Acts, and we're taking a different course this summer. Excuse me, and I will have to drink a couple drinks today. I I don't usually drink water, but but I'm very dry the last uh, couple days, so I bet you wish you had one, right? (laughs) Well, anyway, when you think of great leaders, when we think of great leaders in Scripture, we often think perhaps of the prophets, maybe Elijah, Elisha, Samuel, Jeremiah, maybe others like Daniel or Abraham, Isaac, Moses, or the kings like David and Solomon, but among probably the greatest kings... um, was probably that Hezekiah. He returned genuine worship to the land and brought in some reforms, reinstituted the priest's duties that had been forgotten and lost, and brought back worship again in the land that had been forgotten. What Hezekiah did was more than just bring some positive changes. He he brought changes back that caused Israel to turn to the Lord and made them prosper because of those changes and this kind of change brings reforms and such reforms like worship and holy living and righteousness which God had in mind for Israel now you know this was some what 204 260 years after King David so we have the division of of Israel and Judah we have uh, from the time of Solomon's son uh, uh, Rehoboam and and that there was a division there so Ten of the kingdoms branched off, and we have Judah and, and Israel remaining. But at this time here, we have Hezekiah. He is king, and he is bringing in all of these changes, and, and the people are responding. It's making real change in the land, and this was true reformation. Now, when you hear the word reformation, you probably think of one guy, right? You think of Luther, Martin Luther, who nailed his 95 Theses to the wall of the chapel, the the there and and the changes that he knew understand by this little uh, German monk all of a sudden the the words became 
real, that by grace you're saved through faith, his eyes were opened, and boom, he, he, there was a liberation by the Holy Spirit born inside of him that changed the church forever, and the church changed away from the rules and made up uh, uh, rules that were made in the Catholic Church to, to then branching off into what we know as Protestantism. And, and so God brought introduce, introduction of grace through him. So Reformation is important, but Reformation just didn't change. We call it Reformation. Uh, uh, just didn't change a few things. It changed a lot of things. Reformation means to change the way we do things, instituting new disciplines in life that, that transform the life and make us go a different direction than the way that we we're going. So those things can be hard. In fact, Reformation begins with us. It begins with me. In 2 Chronicles 31, verse 20, Scripture says of Hezekiah, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. And every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God, in accordance with the law and the commandments, seeking his God, he did with all of his heart and prospered. Real change in a generation of men doesn't begin by waiting for someone else to do it. Amen? Nothing else, nothing will get done if we wait for someone else to do it. A change in a generation of fathers and men in, a gen in general begins with the, the man that we see in the mirror every morning. The Bible says Hezekiah did all of these things seeking God with all of his heart. So let's begin there. What does that look like? Well, we know the commandments of Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your paths straight or straight your paths if you read an ESV. The scripture requires of us something and this scripture could be, we could, we could uh, dissect it all morning. It's, it's full of great stuff. I, the statement trust in the Lord with all of your heart alone is, is powerful enough. But then the second part, do not lean on your own understanding is, is that because men are prone to sin and, and that we are prone in our life, men and women, and we're talking about mankind, but that the knowledge of that, understanding that is a first and foremost priority, trusting God is the one that will make our path straight. So instituting new disciplines in life and, and things that are important for that are really important. The scripture requires of us something in order to completely trust in God is not to lean on our own comprehensions. That means that a man who will make real change will begin by knowing what God says about him and his life. And now just talking specifically to men this morning, I, I want to reiterate this. It means that being a man... In today's culture, especially means a man being invested in God's word. It's a big challenge today because we are, live in a generation that doesn't believe the Bible is the word of God, even among those raised in church. In fact, a survey of more than 20,000 20 to 40 year olds that were raised in church says that 20% said they don't believe the Bible is true and historically accurate. To those of us who have been a seminary, that's laughable, but to the world, it's not. 22% of the of people who do not believe the Bible is true and accurate said the Bible has errors and that it was made, and that's what made them doubt. Interesting. Only 59% say they consider themselves born again. How sad. These are people raised in church. 42% who attended Sunday school said their Sunday school teachers did not teach them how to defend their Christian faith by reading Bible verses that, you know, reiterated an apologetic argument. 62% said that they believe if you are a good person on earth, you're, you're going to go to heaven when you die. No faith in Christ necessarily required, just if you're a good person. That, of course, is not biblical. We have to have a faith in Jesus Christ and be a follower of Jesus to go to heaven. More than one in five said they believe that other holy books, like the Quran, are inspired by God. So we have a generation of biblical illiteracy. And it's the fault, I think, of the church in a generation too, but I think it's the fault of men in a generation. You say, Pastor, aren't you being a little harsh on men? On the last Father's Day, I came, a man came up to me and said, I think you're being too harsh on men. I said, I don't think I can be too hard on men at all. If you want to go to me, you want to go with me to a job site on a framing crew and put you to work and, you know, we'll try to outwork each other all day. I'll show you who's hard on who. Men can be hard on each other, right? That's just the way that it is. For many years in churches, though, we teach Bible stories rather than in Sunday school rather than biblical history. And there's a problem that Hezekiah faced, and it's the same one that we face today. He had to make the Bible and the ways of God known again to a generation that had lost touch with God's word. He had to make God's laws and reforms 
known to the people that were absent from even the knowledge of it. Friend, today's generation is far removed from that because men have lost their spiritual fervor. This ought to be the role of men. And men and women are different. I, I can see to that. Uh, you have to be married like five or six minutes to understand that. You know what I'm talking about, guys. You may have positional power, but her influence directs your leadership. And both of these produce wisdom because the power of influence is greater than the power of position. How many men understand this? If you are a good man, you just raise your hand. The power of influence that she has is greater than the power. Of, come on, you know. All it takes is a bat of an eye or a certain word of just away, or an argument that she just has just, just right. And God gives women, women many jobs. I mean, they can do multitask. Men don't have a, they have a harder time multitasking. This is statistically true. It's been proven. Women can be on the phone. I remember Dr. Eckricks talked about this in love and respect. Women can be on the phone. They can be making breakfast, uh, helping their kids with homework, talking to Susan, all joyful and happy and everything. The TV can be on. It can be noisy, ruckus. A man can be in the house. All this noise is going on. His, his buddy Phil calls. He says, shut up, everybody. Okay, Phil, go ahead. That's just the way men and women are. Men like to get things done one way, and women, they can have a bunch of things going on. It's like a woman's conversation looks like a plate of spaghetti. How many have ever heard that? Women speak something like 30,000 more words a day than men. That's a lot. I remember comedian Brad Stein talks about the men and women relationally and how they're different. Women to women relationships are so interesting from man to man relationships. A woman can not see her friend for a few hours and all of a sudden see her in the mall and she's like, oh, hello, hello, hello. A man, you know, sees his buddy walk out of the desert five years ago and says, hey, what's up? I mean, they're just different, right? Men and women are different. It's, it's okay being one task oriented as a purpose, grace directed. God has a purpose in that. God gave men a job and God has given women a job. I think men need to do their job. Men are different than women. I mean, women like all the details, right? It's like me getting a text from Loretta that says, Joe hurt his foot. Pray for him. Well, Pam says, well, was he at work? I say, I, I don't know. I got a text from Loretta that said, Joe hurt his foot to pray for him. Well, what, where did, when did it happen? I don't know. I got a text from Loretta that said, Joe, well, did he go to the hospital? I don't know. I got a text from Loretta that says that Joe, well, do we need to bring him food while he's hurt? I, I don't know. I got a text from Loretta that said Joe heard his foot on the Joe. Well, do we need to help them in any way? Did he, did, does he have to wear a cast? I don't know. I got a text from Loretta that says, I don't really, you don't really know anything then, do you? Well, I guess I don't. Men, men and women are different. I believe that God uses women in so many powerful ways. But my challenge from being is to let change, reformation, begin with us. And we can expect opposition. That's going to happen. In fact, Hezekiah's initiatives suffered opposition. In 2 Chronicles 30, verse 1, if you want to back up with me and read with me, it says, Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the, to the Lord, the God of Israel. Jumping to verse 5. So they decreed to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan that the people should come and keep the Passover to the Lord, God of Israel, Jerusalem, for they had not kept it as often as prescribed. So he's calling everybody to church. He's calling them back to remember uh, the Sabbath. He's doing so many things. He's instituting, he's bringing back the worship. He is calling all the men specifically to rise up. So in verse number 9, it says, For if you turn to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors, and return to this land. For the Lord, your God, is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. Now we find in Scripture here that Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. We also read that some men of Asher and Manasseh came. But Scripture says many scoffed. They heard this plea. Men, rise up. Be the spiritual leaders. Come and worship. Lead in worship. Be the men that God's called you to be. But many scoffed. I think the same is partially true today. Anyone who shares the word of God faithfully, that there will be those who openly ridicule and call them silly. In fact, we should expect scoffers. 
Scripture says, especially in the last days, many will scoff. Second Peter 3, 3, I know you know it well, but it says, knowing first of all that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming forever since our fathers fell asleep? All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. When we begin as men to stand with the word of God, living out loud the principles of God's word, being faithful with your light and beginning to shine it, you will encounter opposition. If you're not, it means your light is not shining enough. Come on now. This is not necessarily great preaching, but it's right preaching. When your talk begins to change, when you begin to enjoy a different kind of humor, or listen to a different kind of music, when you develop a joy in the things God has rather than what everyone else is doing, people will scoff. We have a neighbor that every time we mention Jesus or talk about, she rolls her eyes. She was raised atheist. It's hard to get through her. But you know where she runs to when she needs help. You see, this is the destructive work of sin. It, it tears apart. And how many know people today that, that used to love God? I mean, they were in church. They were committed. They were in discipleship. They were in the men's group, the women's group. Far from How many people know somebody like that? I mean, we all do, right? Well, friends, I contend today that they didn't turn from God in the church or turn their back on Christ because they loved God too little. Rather, they didn't hate sin enough. You see, sin is the crippler. We can love God, but the more we let little things come in and begin to rule and reign in our life, the more important they become and they outweigh the significance of God things. Another reason we need men to rise up in a generation, I think, more than ever, is because religious leaders have compromised. And hold on with me through this, because this is really important. It says in 2 Chronicles 29, 34, but the priests were too few. So Hezekiah calls all of these together, right? We're going to have this worship. We're going to sacrifice. And so what he does, he gets them all together, but there's a problem. The priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until all of the priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. Hezekiah brought back worship, but there was a problem. Not only were there not enough religious leaders to carry out the leading of worship, they were unqualified. They couldn't be trusted, so men from the tribe of Levi had to carry out the duties. You know, man, I got to say, ever more than ever before in our world, I think the church is compromised, and the reason is because we don't have enough men as spiritual leaders. There are leaders of groups of people that have churches that are not founded on biblical authority. They're preaching what modern-day psychology would rather say and, and not preaching the simple but powerful, simple word of God. And you men in this church are the filters. If we preach something untrue, you are the priest of your family. You are the filter. If you hear something not right, you are the filter. Our leaders today found themselves in a, have found themselves in a myriad of false doctrines, I believe, that's flooding the church and filling our worship songs and predominating our pulpits. It was years ago that David Wilkerson said, there will be a generation coming that will worship and praise a God that they will not pray to. I think we've arrived. And the reason for that is because we need godly men. Men who lead their children in prayer. Men who are not afraid to lead spiritually. We've got to raise a standard. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Why be comfortable with sin when we know that God is not comfortable with sin? 
Why continue to live as though we've arrived when we know we haven't? More than ever, we need men who will lead spiritually. We, we trust our wives to lead our children in prayer when we ought to be the ones. We, we let our children in, in a generation see men unwilling to lead spiritually because we're not content to change, but to stay the same. We need men who know God's work and, and can spot wrong doctrine, men who understand what is right or wrong in their children's education, men who know how to pray and worship openly without shame and boldness, men who will take their family to a Bible-teaching church and lead them in church, men who are willing to express love for God, men who lead other men in humility and with prayer, men who love and respect their wives and let their children see that example, men who love God and hate sin, men who love the church and understand the war the church is fighting in the world today and, and hates that. Hezekiah knew the failings of this generation's spiritual leaders and required the men to stand up and take their rightful place to lead worship, speak God's word, and live it without compromise. Man, I believe that you and I are in a war. You are in a war for your masculinity. It's being attacked on every side by feminism and not even knowing what our gender is, a war for your faith, a war for your strength. They want to tear it down. The world and its ideas and its philosophies want to take and make strong men weak. Be filled with the Spirit. Turn the tide on the enemy. I think we need to be on our guard against one of the greatest attacks on men is pride. Not that women don't suffer from this too, but for a minute it's a big one. In fact, let's look back at Hezekiah later on, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 7. Assyria is going to come and they're going to attack. And look what Hezekiah says to his people. Be strong and courageous. Not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him. For there are more of us than there is with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us in to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So here he is doing a pep rally. He's trusting God. And what happens? Assyria comes. They're outnumbered. And God does this incredible thing. They win the great victory. But because of the defeat of the Assyrian army, Hezekiah becomes proud. He doesn't give God the glory that he is due. And when we're involved in serving the Lord, no matter how great or small, we must always remember to give God the glory. Your strength, men, comes from God. Your ability to stand comes from God. The Bible says when you are weak, then he makes strong. It is his strength in you. I know many people come before God and they pray wrong. God, make me strong so that I can overcome this. Give me more. I need to be stronger, God, when the whole time God is asking us to be weak so he can be strong in us. You've got to always give God the glory. Pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the person who has it. <laughs> Let me say that again. Pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the person who has it. It didn't take Hezekiah long to snap out of it. He realized his sin, but he paid a price. Unfortunate for us if we don't realize our pride as well. Let me just reiterate some things about pride. Just a little uh, topical study real quick, but pride hardens the heart toward God. Daniel 5.20, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, but when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed of his royal throne and stripped of his glory. Is from such a mind that an atheist is born, really. Psalm 14.1 says that the fool says in his heart there is no God. I jokingly said this morning that Proverbs, Psalm 14.1 says that God doesn't believe in atheists. Nebuchadnezzar was brought lower than degraded because of his attitude of his heart. Hosea 7.9.10 speaks of pride. It speaks of it sucking the life out of Ephraim. Ephraim meaning double fruit or very, very productive Taking the life pride destroys it. It hardens the heart toward God because we don't need anybody. We, it's, it's, it's too shaming to be weak enough or humble enough to surrender ourselves before God's will. Pride hinders our spiritual growth. Number two, Proverbs 26, 12 says, if you see a man wise in his own eyes, there's more hope for a fool than for him. 
Pride hinders coming to God. Thirdly, Psalm 10, 4, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. In fact, men, Scripture specifically says to you, if you're harsh with your wife, God will not hear your prayer. What a dangerous place to be in. Fourthly, pride causes us to deceive ourselves. I'm sure you've heard it said, if you tell yourself a lie long enough, after a while you begin to believe it's true. In Jeremiah 14, 16, God says that the people had built themselves home in the high places in the cleft of the rock, thinking we're safe now, nothing can happen to us. They told themselves that their actions, through their actions, that they were protected from the Lord's correction. No calamity can get us up here, but they were wrong. And finally, pride leads to ruin. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Wow. The ultimate progression or degression, if there is such a word, is to say that pride destroys. A young people, I hope you hear this. Thinking you know more than your parents. I know better for my life than what my parents might think. I know they know how fast the minivan will go. I know that my Chrysler has 287 horsepower. I know how fast it will go. But I know my boys would never test the boundaries. You see, mom and dad have been there, right? Amen? Come on, parents. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's this hill in Enumclaw. It's by the cemetery. We call it Cemetery Hill, of course. And we used to get going on that thing down 416 and 400 both, but four, I think 416 had the best jump. And, and you get off of there, you know, and you, it, I mean, you'll catch some air. I caught some air just the other day with one of my boys, actually, in a vehicle. It was kind of fun and dangerous. Men are dangerous a little bit. It's okay to be dangerous. But pride leads to ruin. After a while, we begin to say, I know more than everybody. I've got it all figured out. And men, this is a curse in today's society. Beware of pride because it will destroy a lasting legacy is what we're trying to develop. We want to pass on to our children the, the words of wisdom. It requires vigilance. When Hezekiah died, his son Manasseh became king in his place. And, but then what he did was evil in the sight of the Lord. It's hard to fathom how such a godly king like Hezekiah could end up with such an evil son like Manasseh to take his place. But we don't know all the circumstances or details. I think we could speculate if we wanted to. But it underscores the fact that every generation is responsible to know Christ for themselves. We don't know Jesus because of our grandfather's relationship with Jesus, but he can introduce us to Jesus. It's also a warning to us that we must also be vigilant as, as men, I think, to do the very best, and women as well, to raise our kids to carry on a spiritual legacy to the next generation and next and so on and so on. I had one person come to me years ago and they said, Pastor, your kids seem to love the Lord. I said, they're not perfect kids. I said, I know, but my kids are so far from God. Da, da, da. I said, well, did you have them in church? Oh, no. Did you send them to camps every summer? No. Did you send them on missions trips? No. Were they in church and discipleship programs in youth on Wednesdays? No. Were you connected with God's word personally? How was your devotional life? Well, it really wasn't very consistent. I wonder why. You see, that there's, there's a formula in God's word, not that these programs are it only, but that we have to be plugged into Jesus, amen? We've got to be in love with Jesus. We can't let up for one second. The world is watching, and, and the church is needing a generation of men to rise up. The saddest scripture in all of the Bible is found in Judges. In chapter 2, and I'll begin reading in verse 8, it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance, Timnath, Harry's in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that, 
whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. In other words, they died. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. I think that's sad. One generation didn't pass along the information about what God had done. How God had gloriously saved and delivered and brought hope and joy to an entire nation. I think, man, this is a big role of a man today. That we pass along these ideas and that it's a generation. And it's sad because I think this generation fits our generation very well. Because one out of three kids will live without a father. The number of children living apart from their fathers is more than doubled in the last 50 years. From 11% in 1960 to 27% in 2010. Pew Research did a study that said in 1960, 72% of the adult population was married. That, that has dropped to 52% today. 87% of children ages 17 and younger were living with two married parents. 1960 compared with 64% in 2016. 17% to 64%. In 57 years. Can you imagine? We need men who will stick to it. Amen? Men who will provide a lasting legacy. Now, maybe you're sitting here and say, Pastor, I failed as a man, as a father, as a husband. I want you to know that not only is God's grace sufficient, but he wants to restore things that have been broken. Listen, friends, when you were in the world and far from God, lots of destruction happened in your life. But now you're a child of God. Amen. All the hopes and, and the restoration and the joy that Jesus sacrificed on the cross and rose from the grave for is yours. And there is hope that we have that when we pray for our lost sons and daughters, when we, when we pray for restoration, that God will hear that prayer. It so reminds me, we couldn't, we'd be remiss today without talking about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Jesus tells a parable. I'm going to give you the LEV version, the Larry Ellis version. You can download it free. It's on an app. <laughs> Sorry. We actually had more men than women in the first service, which is kind of unusual these days, but it look, kind of looks like we're about 50-50 here today. I don't know. Prodigal Son is a glorious, awesome story that Jesus told, a parable to illustrate something. And I love the story, and the LEV version goes like this. There was a, dad, a guy, a dad, two sons. Only two, we don't know, but that's how Jesus tells the story. And he says, the oldest son was faithful and was with him, but the youngest son comes to him one day and he says, Father, I want to go live my life, so will you give me my share of the inheritance now? I'm glad my boys don't ask me for my inheritance now because they'd probably get a screwdriver. Nonetheless, the father, I don't know how he must have felt, but he gives his son this inheritance. The wealth that was supposed to be due him at the end of his father's life. So he gets in his inheritance and he goes... He spends all this time in wild living. He goes to Las Vegas. It's in the LEV version. He does whatever he can do. He spends money wildly, the Bible says. He, he gathers a lot of friends around him because he's buying all of their stuff and their drinks and their fun and living wild. Well, the money runs out. So he finds a job feeding pigs. And he's so hungry, he wants to eat the pig's food. And then he comes to his senses and he says, what am I doing here? My father's servants eat a lot better than this. I, I'm going to go back to dad and say, dad, I'm so sorry. Just make me a servant. I'd rather be feeding pigs for you and getting a meal than out here in the middle of nowhere to not knowing anybody. He goes home. He humbles himself. And he, he's walking down the road. I love this part. And Jesus, of course, is talking about this story in view of a heavenly father to us. 
And he says, when the father sees him afar off, he runs to his son Can't even tell the story. He runs to his son, he hugs him, and he kisses him. He says, My son who is lost is found. I guess it moves me so much to realize that our God loves us no matter what we've done, no matter how we've turned our back on him, that he still receives us as his sons and daughters. And this guy is a perfect picture of our Heavenly Father. So many tremendous qualities in this picture of Jesus he paints here of a father. Now this father he's speaking of obviously is God and the connection is that no matter what we've done, like I said, we ruin our lives. Our Heavenly Father is always waiting for us by His grace for us to come home again. But there's some things I think, uh, three things I want to point out that are good for us dads fathers today, men. Number one, he shows compassion. He treats his children as his heavenly father treats him. A child will follow the example of their father. Don't let feminism drive this from you, men. It is possible to be masculine and show compassion. It is possible to be a man's man and still have grace. It is possible to be strong and open the door for a woman. It is possible. He shows compassion. Number two, he shows affection. He kisses him. I was a junior in high school, ready to go on band tour. We had this big, long fundraiser, and I played. I was first chair trombone player, and I was excited to go on this trip. And we had a jazz band as well I was participating, played in, and, and it, was a, it was a great time. But anyway... Right before the trip, we're all outside the school, loading on the buses, and parents are you know, telling goodbye to their kids and giving them money for the trip. My dad pulled out a whopping $20 bill. My dad was not a wealthy man. But gave me the $20 bill, and as we're standing there, getting ready to go on the bus, he kisses me. A junior in high school, in front of all of his friends. But that was my dad. You know, he was a strong, fit, loving, six foot four guy. But he was gentle and he showed affection. Kissing your teenage son after he hits a winning shot at the end of a basketball game, if you're a man, probably is a little weird. I don't know. In today's culture. Yeah, you know, I did that one time. When in my freshman year, my mom come running out of the stands, and she's jumping up and down, she's hugging me, you know, and stuff. Now, if Dad would have done that the same way, it would have been weird, right? But see, I think men need to show affection, amen? Any man who has a little girl knows what that's about. Show your affection to your sons, too. Kiss them. I still kiss my boys today. I don't know how much they like it, but I still kiss them. They're my boys. They will always be my boys. Finally, this father views his children as a blessing. Psalm 127.3, sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are reward from him like arrows in the hands of a warrior, sons born in one's youth. Blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. When my boys were young, you know, at Fred Meyer, Pam was busy with something. I had three of them, I think, if I remember correctly. They used to have the double cart, so you put two in. So Brandon would always ride on the end because he was the biggest, you know. So I'm going through the store, get all this stuff, and the boys are being boys. They're, you know, you can only, you know the square tiles in the store? You have to ask Justin to stand in that tile. See, Justin, stand right there in this tile. You can't move from the tile. I mean, literally, right? It's like, good grief, kid. I mean, it was impossible. I, I, when he was little, I'd take, his, I'd take his face in my hands. I'd say, look at me, son. He'd go, yeah. 
still do it today, even though he's bigger than me now. But I remember going to the checkout line, and the boys were, I, I, I think um, Andrew was crying. He usually does, anyway. Um, he didn't. There was something was going on, and he said, you know, there was a girl, the lady that came in line, she just, oh, oh, oh. And she actually told me, she said, you know, you have three kids. Don't you think that's a little reckless? Yeah. Little did she know we had four. But in today's culture, they're not viewed as a blessing. To some degree. I'm glad to see the, the decline in abortion in our culture and some of these things. I think there's some great victories being won. But still do we see children as a blessing. This man did. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher who brought revival to his native Britain, preached, We want again Luther's, Calvin's, Bunyan's, and Whitfield's. These are great preachers. Men fit to mark eras whose names breathe terror in foemen's ears. We have dire need of such. Whence will they come to us? They are the gifts of Jesus Christ to the church and will come in due time. He has power to give us back again a golden age of preachers. And when the good old truth is once more preached by men whose lips are touched with live coal off the altar, this shall be the instrument in the hand of the Spirit for bringing about a great, a great and thorough uh, revival of religion in the land. I do not look for any other means of converting men besides the simple preaching of the gospel and the opening of men's ears to hear it. The moment the church of God shall despise the pulpit, God will despise her. It has been through the ministry that the Lord has always pleased to revive the blessed churches. Men, you are needed in America today. You are needed in politics. You are needed in, in the school. You, you are needed in government. You're needed in the church. You're needed desperately in the family. America needs you, men. It needs you as pastors. I know God uses women in ministry and, and, and bless women for that, but I'm talking to men today. God, Fred, men, we need pastors. Our last annual conference, I'm blessed to see the young pastors coming up and, and, and training and, and doing what they're doing, but we need more. The mega churches are beginning to ask us, smaller churches, how we do small church because they're recognizing people are going away from it. They're looking for the family. They're looking for the connection. We need you as leaders in the church. We need you on the board. We need you as community leaders. Reminds me of Elijah when he's faced with a compromise. He stood up on Mount Carmel. He's surrounded by Baal worshipers and Asherah pole worshipers. And, uh, and he reminds us that, that the world that he was in then, that serving God was the life to live. He was the only one amongst all those people who was standing for God. And of course, the great contest was they would consume the sacrifice by fire and they're dancing around, cutting themselves. And Elijah sits back and he says, maybe your God is hard of hearing. And they're jumping loud and they're shouting louder. And he says, shout louder. Maybe he's busy. The connotation is there. Maybe he's taken a leak. I'm not kidding. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe your God is too busy. And what does he do? He asks them to bring water. They saturate the sacrifice. It fills the, the moat around the sacrifice. He prays a simple prayer. Fire comes from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. He stood alone. He knew God was still God. He knew God never changes. Men change. We will always become distracted by sin. This world is targeted, you men. You are in its crosshairs, so be filled with the Spirit. And be encouraged today. Stand up for Christ without apology. The question is not, where is the God of Elijah? He's never changed. The question is, where are the Elijahs of God? This morning, I want us just to pray, and I'm going to ask our worship team to come. We're going to close by singing a song together. But I want to pray for the men in this room. Maybe you're a father. Maybe you're not a father. That's okay. 
Maybe you're just a guy who wants to know the Lord more. Well, I want to encourage you to join with me in prayer today, and I want to pray God's blessing on your life. Let's stand together. Praise God. Let's sing this song.